So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all on behalf of uh, Isaac Pune Optics League. Uh, so today we, we have with us uh, Professor Mandar Deshmukh from TIFR Mumbai to give a brief introduction about uh, Professor Deshmukh. He got his PhD in physics from Cornell University and then he was a postdoctoral researcher in Harvard University. And now he is a associate pro uh, is a professor at uh, Data Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. So with this brief introduction, I will uh, request Professor Deshmukh to please start the, today's talk. Okay, great. Thank you very much for, thanks for inviting me uh, to uh, tell you a little bit about our work. Um, so I, uh, I know this is sort of a, um, Optica student chapter. So I don't really, uh, I mean, we do some optical uh, techniques relate uh, measurements with uh, electronics, uh, but I'll try to bring out things that might be interesting directly uh, from the perspective of optics. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, sort of two uh, areas uh, that we work on in our lab, which are related to um, uh, superconductivity, uh, uh, in particular, high TC superconductivity in two dimensions and magnetism, uh, both in layered materials. Okay, so I gratefully acknowledge the support that we get from, uh, you know, two primary funding agencies, Department of Atomic Energy, uh, which funds a substantial amount of our research and Department of Science and Technology from which uh, I've had several grants and uh, we have benefited from this. So I will talk about uh, the story that's in these two papers. Uh, I will, uh, in the interest of time, skip some details. Uh, you are welcome to ask me those questions about those details uh, uh, or also read these two uh, papers for uh, additional details. So let me get started. Um, uh, I uh, am, I, I'm fortunate to have uh, really amazing uh, students, uh, young researchers and postdocs working with me. Uh, they make the exciting things happen and I get a chance to present their exciting work. So I wanna make sure that I acknowledge their uh, contribution. So for this particular work, experiments on uh, high TC superconductors were done with by Sanat and he's a PhD student. Um, and uh, experiments related to uh, Van der Waals antiferromagnets were done by uh, this, a uh, student who was interning as uh, Lucky Kapoor, who is now doing his PhD at IST uh, in Vienna. And uh, another PhD student, uh, Supriyo, collaborated on these studies of uh, magnetism in Van der Waals materials. And I collaborated uh, for some of these experiments uh, with uh, two colleagues at TF. Uh, Tamil Wales group, we have extensive collaboration to uh, uh, make high quality uh, crystals, uh, which are the studies that we uh, conduct. All right. So, what do we do? Uh, this is a bird's eye uh, view, sort of introduction to the work that we do in our lab. Uh, we uh, look at uh, quantum transport. In that uh, one area that we have been working uh, very extensively in the last few years is uh, physics of uh, Josephson junctions. Uh, uh, in using 2D systems. Uh, we have been working uh, with a, you know, 2D superconductors. In particular, our interest is in high temperature superconductors, uh, looking at magnonics, which is essentially looking at excitations of, of uh, mag through magnons, uh, which don't really involve any electrons, and they have significant advantages that I will uh, explain a little bit later in the talk. Uh, we have uh, a long-standing interest in looking at mechanics of uh, nanoscale systems, uh, including, uh, you know, one atom thick membranes, asking uh, what is happening to its elastic property, what is uh, the dissipation. And uh, we have a substantial effort looking at quantum transport. Uh, in the recent past, we have been looking at twisted uh, uh, systems, uh, where twisted graphene and twisted trilayer, they have some interesting properties. Um, but today my focus will be on uh, these two things. So roughly half an hour, uh, in about 25 minutes, 
uh, each, I'll try to give you a glimpse for the work that we are doing in these two areas, superconductivity and magnetism. Um, and please uh, feel free to interrupt if you have any question. Uh, I'm happy to uh, have interruptions uh, during the talk. Okay, so this is my brief outline uh, for my talk. Uh, I am going to uh, present uh, uh, work on high temperature superconductors. So some of you might be uh, sort of new to this area. So I'll provide a brief pedagogical introduction to why this is interesting. And uh, then I'll uh, kind of sum up with what our uh, accomplishment is or the main result is. Then I'll uh, shift gears and talk about van der Waals magnets. This is um, somewhat less studied than semiconductors, uh, you know, MOS2 and graphene, they're, uh, you know, heavily densely populated research areas. Uh, magnetism and superconductivity is uh, somewhat less studied, but it is, uh, it has very interesting physics and it's a little bit more uh, technically challenging experiments to do. So the, uh, what I will show you is, in an antiferromagnet uh, can actually uh, have a coupling between them. Um, and uh, it leads to a magnon-magnon uh, coupling in an antiferromagnet. And uh, the an antiferromagnetic spin waves uh, are actually uh, very interesting um, because they can travel uh, long distances. Uh, so if you want to do any um, uh, sort of uh, uh, make any devices then uh, based on spin waves, which is sort of the area of magnonics, then uh, it's actually a, a nice system to work with. So that's sort of my rough outline for today's talk. I'll, towards the end, I'll tr try to say uh, where we are headed. I might have a slide or two to give you a glimpse of uh, where we are headed with these experiments. Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, is it possible to uh, turn off that uh, beeping sound uh, when somebody joins? It's a little bit irritating. Uh, if it's not, if it's possible, yeah, can you please turn it off? Okay, so uh, uh, now high temperature superconductors have been studied for decades, uh, okay? So it's one of, the, uh, one of the more mature fields in material science and uh, certainly physics. Uh, and the amazing thing about it is that um, uh, still there are lots of open questions about it. Um, uh, what is agreed upon or understood is that superconductivity in cuprate super, high temperature superconductors arises from the copper oxygen planes uh, and the parent state is an antiferromagnetic insulating uh, state and then you kind of dope um, uh, create vacancies or uh, dope it with uh, electrons or, or, you know, way to say it is dope it with holes or electrons, you uh, get into superconducting states and the uh, uh, symmetries agreed to be something like DE order wave uh, order uh, parameter. Um, uh, but there are many open questions about the microscopics of the superconductivity. And what is understood is that it ha they have some complex phase diagram. Uh, so to make this phase diagram, uh, you know, it's like a, uh, you have to keep on changing. You have to make a new crystal uh, for each of uh, this X values to map out this phase diagram. And the experiments that I will show you and actually allow you to re uh, see the, uh, the full phase diagram in actually a single device. Uh, and uh, that's sort of one of the fun things that you can do uh, by combining ideas from uh, sort of a uh, new kind of electrostatic doping of devices. So uh, 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 lives in a kind of a dome shaped region and the superconducting temperature uh, can be of the above uh, liquid nitrogen temperature, which is sort of a critical uh, temperature scale in terms of possible applications. Uh, these are the antiferromagnetic states. There's a lot of also interesting complicated physics, uh, you know, whether it's uh, what kind of a metallic state it is, but I won't uh, talk about that uh, much today because that's not something we will focus on uh, in today's talk. So the particular system that I will uh, talk a, uh, about uh, is called, acronym is BISCO. Uh, it's particular is Two two one two uh, version. So it has a crystal structure which is uh, uh, looks quite complex. Uh, you know there are planes of bismuth oxygen, 
instance, there are planes of strontium oxygen, and then there are these uh, copper oxygen planes, and then an intervening buffer layer, if you like, of calcium, then again, a copper oxygen plane, strontium, bismuth oxygen. So this is half a unit cell, and then again, this thing uh, repeats. So there are basically four uh, copper oxygen planes in, um, in uh, uh, one unit cell, and the unit cell is about uh, three nanometers. Uh, now, uh, the phase diagram of the superconductor, I already alluded to it, it is a superconductor. Uh, and in case of BISCO, uh, the uh, peak uh, superconducting temperature is uh, about 85 Kelvin. Okay, And then as you dope it, uh, the super transition temperature can actually be reduced. Uh, the nice thing about BISCO uh, is that the van der Waals interaction between these uh, uh, you know, sort of the uh, layers is somewhat weaker compared to other uh, high TC superconductors. So uh, there are extensive studies on BISCO, both for STM measurements, primarily because uh, this crystal can be cleaved inside an STM and the fresh pristine surface can be exposed to, to do imaging. That's also the reason why a lot of ARPES uh, studies are also done on this uh, system, uh, okay? Uh, at low temperature, uh, these are very stable. At ambient temperature, something tricky about these uh, BISCO particularly and other uh, high TC superconductor is that this oxygen has a tendency to diffuse out. Uh, and then uh, if you just sit up, put a crystal uh, of BISCO on room temperature on your table, then uh, likely after uh, you know, a, a month or so, actually not be uh, what you started with. It, it has basically degraded just by sitting uh, at room temperature. So that's something you have to be careful of. Uh, but the fact that they are cleavable uh, allows us to peel it down to one unit cell limit. And that's the, that's the kind of experiment that we I will describe to you. We peel off uh, layers of BISCO uh, uh, down to one unit cell or two unit cells. So one unit cell is about three nanometers. Uh, and uh, half a unit cell is about 1.5 nanometers. Uh, this is basically, um, the marker. yeah, this is basically half a unit cell. So, um, uh, uh, and it, this is a well studied uh, system uh, with, and it is known to have a D wave uh, order parameter. So, uh, two dimensional atomic crystals have uh, been. Uh, in vogue, uh, you know, starting uh, with um, paper, uh, this paper, and subsequent papers from Gaim's group, and uh, and the, then after that, it's a tap that has actually cannot be turned off. Um, and they basically started with peeling off um, layers of uh, different, uh, and uh, you know, and the. The high TC superconductors, for example, were late entrants. And, uh, you know, this is way back in 2005, people had already peeled off uh, MOS2, graphene, NBSE2. Um, and if you look carefully uh, in that paper somewhere, you'll find, uh, you know, we also tried to make, make uh, peel layers of uh, BISCO, uh, but uh, they always remain insulating. And that that problem is actually something to do with the instability of the oxygen in the copper oxygen planes. It oxygen actually uh, diffuses out and becomes off stoichiometric. And then this material is basically uh, a boring um, insulator or a boring ceramic. So people had inkling, but technically there are several challenges had to be overcome. So now you might say, okay, look, we already know a lot about BISCO or high TC superconductors. There's been uh, a good bit of, uh, you know, uh, three, four decades of uh, very intense work, uh, then wh why should one worry about, uh, you know, uh, studying one unit of, of BISCO? And to motivate that, I give you an example of uh, another system that people are interested in is ion selenides. Um, so ion selenides are an interesting and unusual superconductors, but one remarkable uh, aspect about ion selenides that people found is that if you have one monolayer ion selenide uh, uh, grown by MBE, not by exfoliation method. Uh, people 
on a particular substrate, that interaction of that ion selenide with the substrate, one monolayer super, uh, superconducting uh, critical temperature is something close to 70 Kelvin, whereas bulk is much lower. Uh, bulk FESC is something like um, you know, 35 Kelvin. So if going to one monolayer, somehow uh, one can tune the superconducting temperature by a factor of two, then imagine if you do something like that with high TC superconductor, then the potential reward of uh, uh, such a experiment is immense. And that's sort of the idea uh, that motivated a large number of people. Uh, and uh, another fact is that you have some new knobs available which are not uh, available uh, that are for use in um, bulk superconductors. And I'll talk, tell you about it. So the monolayer can actually be very different from the bulk. Uh, and uh, that's why a large number of people have been. So uh, there have been some recent experiments uh, on, on BISCO, uh, uh, in, you know, increasingly large number. It, it doesn't have as many number of people working on it as uh, MOS2 or graphene, just because the system is extremely hard. It took us you know, three, four years to get the handle on how to make sure that the uh, Bisco crystal doesn't degrade while we make devices out of it. Uh, so it's a, a, uh, the activation energy that you need to uh, make successful devices with this uh, is uh, substantially higher than to make devices out of graphene or MOS2. So people have done experiments where uh, you know you make a, uh, a single layer of MO, uh, of Bisco device and use a ionic solid uh, like a glass, which is also what we'll be using and dope it. So the same device, uh, just like you can uh, make a gate to tune the density of a field effect transistor of graphene, you can do that with BISCO as well, except that you need a very high capacitive coupling uh, because the charge density in BISCO is much higher than uh, graphene. Uh, so you cannot use silicon oxide-like scheme. So you have to use uh, kind of essentially the Debye layer of a solid or a liquid to tune it. And people have demonstrated this, not, uh, that you can tune the uh, critical temperature by 20, 30 Kelvin. Not just that, with a single sample, uh, people have shown that you can tune the uh, TC um, and uh, track the phase diagram. Uh, while uh, in the bulk, uh, you had to make uh, one crystal for every doping level. And then the disorder realization that you have is actually going to be different. Uh, so this is where the power of these uh, devices come is that uh, you can work with a single device and dope it uh, electrostatically. Um, so uh, the other aspect of superconductivity that's connected to what I'll talk about is that one wants to, you know, kind of uh, tune the superconductivity spatially. Uh, okay, uh, some region which is superconducting and some region that's not superconducting. And that's because you can make really fun devices with uh, high DC superconductors, particularly BISCO. You can make uh, terahertz uh, sources out of it um, because the layers of copper oxygen, uh, they're actually forming a weak Josephson junctions. So, and Josephson junctions, when you are properly biased, they can actually emit terahertz radiation. Um, and uh, it's that terahertz radiation is actually tunable. So this is one of the things that is motivating us for uh, some future experiments to make a large scale arrays. Uh, but the essence is that you want to uh, kind of modify superconductivity. The other way people, uh, oh, spatially, and so uh, one way people have done is something like helium ion. You can't uh, use FIB uh, very easily on these materials because again, the processing or e-beam lithography or reactive ion etching will actually uh, damage the crystals and it's no longer superconductor. So it's, these are really, really finicky materials. But overall, uh, all these applications to make interesting devices require spatially uh, patterning or modifying uh, superconductivity over space. And that's the, the thing that uh, our work uh, has accomplished um, uh, uh, in, in uh, these systems that I'll tell you about. So I give you a quick introduction uh, to, uh, and now I kind of shift gears and tell you about our work, uh, sort of local modification of superconductivity in BISCO uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and the resulting devices, uh, which will include a bolometric detector. 
so how does one get a thin layer of disco? So many of you probably in the audience work with 2D materials and you know, uh, your best for, uh, equipment in your lab is the roll of scotch tape that you have. So you probably have a favorite brand uh, and um, you use that. That works really well for uh, most 2D materials. Uh, it turns out it's actually not very uh, um, good for bisco it's much harder to uh, peel off using tape um, method uh, so one method that works really well is is a method which is called anodic bonding um, so you basically take a glass which has uh, uh, sodium ions inside it and you put the crystal on top and you essentially apply a large voltage across it so what ends up happening is that ions move close to the substrate and uh, at the interface, you end up uh, forming a strong bond. And then you peel it off and you can get very large crystals, uh, orders of 100 micron. This trick works for uh, other crystals as well, incl including graphene and MOS2. This was not figured out by us, but there's a, a group, uh, some of you might know Abhay Shukla very well, is in Paris. His group uh, sort of figure this out and it works very well for bisco and that's why for graphene but we use it for uh, extensively for uh, bisco so that's how we make uh, one or two unit cell thick which can be uh, large so typically uh, we you know to make electrical connections to uh, monolayer bilayer or 2D materials, you use electron bibliography or some sort of uh, processing in the clean room. So you spin resist. Uh, so because of the uh, sort of delicate stoichiometry of the copper oxygen planes, this process kills the material. So you can't actually do it. Uh, so the lithography, the conventional uh, method doesn't work. Uh, what you have to do is uh, a very actually simple technique. Uh, it's called shadow mask. So you have to um, sten use a stencil like this and you align it with your flake uh, and that you've formed and then you deposit metal directly without any uh, resist coating. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this trick of lithography, this is probably the easiest lithography method. Uh, uh, stencil, it's like uh, making rangoli. Instead of you make a rangoli with powder, you make rangoli with metal uh, and that metal gets uh, deposited through these holes and makes electrical connections. And uh, this is uh, makes very good contacts and uh, is rapid uh, and it works very well for BISCO, okay, because it's uh, delicate. So once we make these devices, uh, we can do uh, studies on uh, uh, the superconducting uh, properties of these, uh, uh, these films. And we find that these, um, I'll show you more uh, articles, but these crystals are very high quality crystals. They, are, they don't have defects. We've done extensive TEM imaging uh, as well. Um, so disorder is not uh, the dominant uh, problem in this system. Uh, we can peel off down to one unit cell uh, and they show the physics of BKT transition, which is, uh, which only takes place when the disorder uh, is not a dominant mechanism. So it's a relatively clean uh, system um, wh where one can study superconductivity. So uh, this is what our device looks like. So uh, you know this region uh, that you see, it's uh, actual BISCO was much larger, uh, but we uh, essentially use a very, um, a rudimentary method after we make the device, we actually uh, scrape the one unit cell thick BISCO uh, from these regions because we don't want them to short our electrodes. So this gray region is BISCO, uh, one or two unit cell. And uh, we want to tune the superconductivity. So what we do is serendipitously, we figured out that if you have a 2D material and you deposit something uh, on top, just depositing something on top actually can tune the properties. Okay, so in case of BISCO, uh, what we do is we deposit a line of chromium, which is only about 10 nanometer uh, thick in the right through the middle of the flake. And then we try to ask what happens to the transport uh, through this region. So the BISCO is only um, about two unit cells, two or 
uh, at most three unit cells thick and we deposit uh, a line of chromium uh, on it. And what we find is a uh, kind of uh, a surprising result that now what we do is we measure the, the superconductivity uh, in just the pink region using these probes, which are indicated by the uh, orange voltmeter and across this line of chromium, uh, which is at this uh, blue voltmeter, if you like, and what we find is if we measure the resistance as a function of temperature uh, for the region which does not involve chromium in its path, uh, we see a very nice superconducting transition, um, okay? Uh, but for the part of the device that involves chromium, we see a, a start of a, a superconducting transition, but eventually it actually starts to behave like an insulator. Resistance increases as temperature is reduced. So. Uh, this really uh, is unusual, um, okay? So, uh, so uh, you know, one way to think about this uh, sort of resistance response as a function of temperature is to think in the simplest sense as a kind of uh, series resistor model. So you have BISCO, uh, you know, this pink part of the BISCO, which is pristine, nothing has happened to it because it doesn't see chromium. And then the region uh, which is covered by chrome, it has different properties. Uh, but from the experiment on this uh, part of uh, BISCO, you can see that it has a pristine superconducting transition. So these two parts show uh, a superconducting transition just as one would expect. But um, uh, for the region which involves chrome, we actually see a beginning of a superconducting transition, which is because it also involves some of these uh, series resistance. So it starts to drop, but then it doesn't go down to zero. Um, but actually go, uh, goes, start going up. And it's, what's happening is that the chromium, deposition of chromium uh, actually makes the BISCO insulating. Uh, and happens primarily because this is a, a, a kind of a, a, a leveraging of the fact that the BISCO is two dimensions. So if you do it on a BISCO big crystal, uh, the chromium actually doesn't diffuse uh, or tune the superconductivity much. I'll tell you about the mechanism, but uh, when you have it only one or two unit cells thick, it actually all through something close to 20 nanometers, just the deposition of chromium on the top uh, makes it insulating. Okay, so that's sort of the take home message of this. Um, and then we did sort of detailed measurements to understand uh, what's happening. So if you look at uh, the same similar kind of devices, if, because it's important to make controlled measurements on the same device next to it, uh, primarily because uh, as I uh, already told you, uh, the BISCO is a bit of a finicky material. So to convince people and ourselves something is happening, then we have to show that right next to um, uh, the region where superconductivity is getting modified, uh, uh, BISCO is pristine and it ha has nice properties. So this is kind of a textbook property of uh, BISCO, uh, which is only, uh, few units cells thick. And if you look at the region which involves chromium, it demonstrates a resistance, a, a finite resistance, even at low, below the superconducting transition temperature. That's basically, uh, you know, this is the IV curve, which is like zero resistance state. This uh, shows a finite resistance all the time. And uh, if you're familiar with it, this is the differential resistance plot as a function of the current going through this device and it has a peak which is indicative of the dissipation within this um, uh, device. So uh, this confirms that something uh, fundamentally interesting and different happens uh, when you uh, deposit uh, some metal uh, on top of a superconductor, okay? So we try to understand uh, what uh, could be the mechanism uh, and the possible mechanisms can be that you, you know, when you deposit uh, by evaporation some material, the crystal damages uh, or there is some chemical modification or some uh, magnetic interaction. And to understand this, uh, we did several uh, other experiments. So we deposited just chrome, uh, so just gold rather, which is chemically inert. And we see that nothing happens to the superconductivity. It just remains robust. Uh, and, um, and to understand the specificity of uh, different uh, uh, systems, uh, we try to deposit some other uh, material system to understand what's going on. So if you deposit titanium, uh, 
then uh, somebody wants my screen. I'm in my office there. Um, uh, uh, so uh, if I do the same experiment with titanium, we see that uh, you actually don't make it insulating, but you tune the TC, you reduce the temp uh, superconducting tra uh, transition. So if this is a <coughs> superconducting transition of BISCO, uh, just depositing a very uh, thin layer of titanium on top actually makes um, the superconducting transition of BISCO uh, tuned down. And this is actually desirable for um, some experiments. Okay, so what's happening is that there is some interesting material science uh, and uh, physics. Uh, and to understand what's happening, uh, we try to look at the copper oxygen um, uh, sort of bonds or the place where the superconductivity resides. And uh, the, that bonds, um, uh, you know, sort of characteristic uh, uh, energies are binding uh, revealed by photo emission, uh, we could measure. And we, we find that just depositing a little bit of chrome actually fundamentally changes the, um, the nature of the copper oxygen bonds uh, and also reflected in uh, the binding energy of the oxygen. Uh, so that tells us that uh, something uh, interesting happens when we deposit metal. You know, the interesting thing is that down to about 20 nanometers, you can see uh, this uh, modification, uh, which is unusual. So we were quite surprised by this. Uh, subsequently, we've also done high resolution uh, TM images, which is TM imaging, which also bears out these um, experimental uh, observations. Okay. So the way to think about the superconductivity getting modified spatially is that uh, you know, by depositing a metal on top uh, reactive materials of different uh, chemistry, uh, you can actually uh, locally dope uh, the material and uh, you can either make it insulating uh, or uh, a bad metal uh, instead of a superconductor with reduced TC. That's sort of the take home message of uh, this experiment. So you might say, okay, what, you know, what can you do with it? Um, and so I'm gonna show you some experiments. You can actually make wires which are very narrow. So you can make wires which are about submicron wide. The way to do it is you put two lines of chromium and you make the current flow through a kind of a narrow pass. Uh, okay. Wires can be, uh, these wires uh, are submicron, you know, something like 300 nanometers wide. Uh, they're about two nanometers thick and then can, they can be microns long. Uh, and um, crystalline structure wise, they're actually uh, very good, uh, okay? So we, we started making these uh, devices. Uh, they are good for actually uh, C-axis transport, which is basically making the current go uh, perpendicular to the layer of copper oxygen planes, which is sort of reflected here. What I'm gonna show you next is the other, uh, you know, advantage of making devices like this, you can actually make uh, very sensitive bolometers uh, with, uh, so a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, exciting detectors in, um, uh, you know, astronomy uh, are actually superconductors. Uh, uh, they act like, uh, you basically make arrays of those superconductors to make cameras, which allow you imaging, which is broadband. Uh, and, uh, what they have is basically a, a, a bunch of uh, arrays elements like this. Uh, those are typically uh, have superconductors which have TC around 10 Kelvin. And there are some interesting things you can do uh, naturally with uh, devices like this, which work at uh, 77 Kelvin. So what we started doing is making uh, devices like this and to uh, study their bolometric response. Okay, so we make a narrow wire um, of BISCO and uh, try to uh, look at its properties, uh, how it will change. Uh, so to, before we look at the optics of it, we try to study uh, you know, the electrical properties. So the, you have BISCO, uh, but then you have uh, the wire. Uh, they show a nice uh, superconducting transition. 
the wires have a broader superconducting transition, which is likely due to some disorder at the boundaries, but nevertheless, they have a pretty good superconducting transition. And they demonstrate, they have hysteretic response, uh, which is uh, well understood to be due to hotspots in, uh, in the system. As you sweep the critical current, it goes normal, but then on the way back, the retrapping current is uh, smaller uh, than the uh, uh, switching uh, current. And uh, there's basically a, a weak spot where uh, because of the dynamics of the junction, uh, you have a, a hot spot where uh, it uh, starts uh, having dissipation within the system. And people have studied this uh, uh, in different regimes. What is unique about our work is uh, we are looking at a, in a regime which is uh, with high TC superconductors has actually not been explored before. Um, uh, and trying to ask whether these uh, systems have uh, what is the mechanism of phase slip? So in superconductors, the dissipation starts, uh, you get a resistance whenever the, there is a superconducting phase uh, has a slip. Uh, so this is sort of lots of other experiments, uh, but then in our uh, system as well, if I plot the differential resistance, which is kind of the derivative of that, I see steps which correspond to different phase slip limits. So what we did was uh, that uh, we tried to image these phase slip events. Okay, so what we did was uh, we mounted this in our, in our optical cryostat, which has nice PSO, so we can raster the laser around um, uh, and uh, looked at the photoresponse uh, spatially uh, and then uh, try to also understand um, uh, the efficiency of the detector. So. Uh, this is the differential resistance here. The device is superconducting. Here, these peaks correspond different phase slips inside the to dissipate. And if I look at the photo voltage, which is basically you shine light uh, and measure the voltage developing across the device, uh, this is the photo voltage response that you get. Uh, the voltage that you measure across the device because of shining light. And uh, what we can do is we bias it at a particular point and we move the laser beam around. So these are sort of the dotted region here is the region which is chromium deposited and this is the narrow wire. So if we bias it here, uh, we see a, a, a region, a hotspot which corresponds to this physical location um, inside the wire. Uh, if we bias it at this point, uh, there is a completely different hotspot. So basically these are uh, essentially imaging of uh, phase slips within the high temperature superconductor. Uh, and uh, what it suggests is that uh, in long wires, you know, this length scale is about 30 microns. The aspect ratio of these wires is quite um, unusual, uh, 30 microns long, uh, about two or three nanometers thick, uh, sorry, three to four nanometers thick, uh, either two um, unit cells uh, thick. Uh, and these are, they're basically different uh, phase slip events, uh, which are uh, giving rise to a photovoltage response. And then these uh, phase slip events are actually acting like uh, a genesis of uh, interesting bolometric uh, response, uh, responses within the system. And this is, uh, you can actually, because you use PSOs, and so uh, one has to be careful about uh, making sure that one doesn't, uh, have relative drift. So you can simultaneously image uh, from the reflected light, uh, the position of these chrome regions. So you know exactly where um, the uh, photo response is large. Okay, so what, what in effect one, is done, uh, one has realized is a bolometric detector, um, you know, uh, and it's broadband. We benchmark this in um, visible to um, uh, IR, uh, and uh, these are not the best uh, detectors, but uh, they're not too uh, bad. Um, we haven't done sort of optimizations in terms of geometry. So there is uh, lots of room for improvement for these um, uh, bolometric detectors. So the photovoltage response can be quite large. Uh, and uh, we uh, sort of measured uh, how the bolometric response is, what's the responsibility is, and, uh, and the noise equal in power. So it's, uh, 
it's not uh, the best, but it's actually has lots of room. Uh, so these kind of devices are an area that we are pursuing um, uh, quite uh, earnestly um, because uh, you know devices like squids can be made uh, and uh, we're working on this. So just to summarize, I uh, so far in about last uh, 35 minutes or so, I told you about uh, sort of high temperature superconductivity in 2D uh, limit and how you can tune that superconductivity uh, spatially um, to realize, for example, you can realize super lattices uh, with this core now uh, that we know, and that's another area that we're looking at. In the remaining time, which I have roughly about 15 to 20 minutes, I'll try to give you a sense for another um, area, which is uh, really exciting uh, for us, which is a magnets, Van der Waals magnets, which are basically layered magnets. And what we do is probe their dynamics uh, 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 and it gives some interesting information about how spin waves travel. So, uh, you know, about four or five years ago, there was a kind of explosion in uh, work in um, related to uh, magnetism in the 2D limit with some experiments uh, with a system which is uh, called chromium triiodide and uh, other systems which are like it called chromium uh, chloride or chromium bromide. They are honeycomb lattice. Uh, you'll see more about it in the next. Uh, down to one unit, one layer thickness, one unit cell thickness, uh, they retain their magnetism. Uh, so these are uh, experiments done. Uh, uh, this data is from uh, Zhao Dong Zhu's group at University of Washington, Seattle. So one unit cell thick uh, shows a very nice hysteresis. Uh, you know, this is, I think, um, up to 10 Kelvin or so. Uh, and uh, this uh, has an interesting, um, uh, you know, connected connection to fundamental ideas in physics and fluctuations because uh, what these experiments have opened up is a new way to probe uh, magnetism in strictly in 2D limit, which at least has been very hard to accomplish. So you can may uh, different materials allow you to realize Ising magnets in 2D limits. So chromium triiodide is an example of it. You can realize XY uh, sort of magnets where uh, sort of the spin lives in the plane. And you have uh, magnets where the spin uh, is, uh, the atoms are in strictly two dimensions actually be oriented. So these are questions uh, that uh, people have been uh, sort of trying to answer for a long time, but now you have systems and uh, tools available. Uh, okay, so that's the reason we are, uh, we got interested in it. Our interest is in actually the dynamics of these magnetic uh, uh, excitations, because if you want to make anything useful um, uh, and uh, then you want to understand the dynamics also uh, beyond the statics of uh, this system. So uh, I'm gonna, some of you probably already know this well. So I'm gonna quickly tell you a little bit about how one excites the dynamics of it because it'll be kind of important to understand. So if typically, if you have a magnetic moment, um, uh, you know, and you have a, a DC magnetic field, uh, by applying a time varying magnetic field, you can actually make the magnetic moment uh, process around uh, the direction of the DC magnetic field. Okay. Uh, and that, that precession motion uh, is sort of uh, related to this idea of uh, a ferromagnetic resonance when you kind of dump energy into it and you overcome the internal losses of this precession. Uh, very nice resonance. And uh, this technique can actually tell you about, uh, you know, the exchange constant uh, uh, and um, I, I help you understand uh, what's the spectrum of um, excitations of the spin inside the system. Okay. So the way people do it and the way we do it is that uh, for applying time varying magnetic fields, uh, the typical uh, time variation uh, that one is looking at is at a time scale of nanoseconds uh, for ferromagnets. 
for antiferromagnets, it can be as high as terahertz. Uh, it's related to the exchange interaction. Um, okay. So the way you apply study these systems is applying uh, uh, magnetic fields that vary at you know nanosecond time scale is basically done using techniques in RF electronics, uh, which is basically to put the sample uh, on a transmission line and you send electrical signals at uh, gigahertz, uh, you know, or tens gigahertz if you like. And when you send the signal, uh, there's an oscillating magnetic field that applies this perturbation that you need. So uh, you can study the dynamics by applying a DC magnetic field and then on top of it, applying a time varying magnetic field of um, uh, positioning the sample close to the wave drive. And that's sort of what we do. Uh, this dynamics uh, for ferromagnets typically is uh, referred to as the LLG equation, uh, landau lifshitz gilbert uh, equation, which describes the dynamics. For antiferromagnets, it's a little bit more complex and antiferromagnets are receiving a lot of attention uh, compared to ferromagnets because they have some uh, advantages uh, that I will uh, briefly describe. So uh, people have looked at the dynamics of this magnetization uh, using um, studies that uh, earlier I was talking to Ashish, doing some Raman studies on this chromium triiodide uh, have been done uh, looking at some of essentially antiferromagnetic resonance um, uh, on chromium trichloride. It allows you to um, uh, uh, sort of excite different uh, magnetic modes of the system. Uh, and so we uh, want you to also uh, study particularly the uh, excitation of uh, uh, magnetic uh, dynamics and in particular, uh, we want, were interested in looking at spin waves, how the spin waves are excited in, uh, in this 2D material. So uh, what we uh, focused on are Van der Waals antiferromagnets. So, you know, you might say, why are antiferromagnets interesting? Because, you know, all this while people were uh, sort of crazy about ferromagnets. So one of the advantages of antiferromagnets is that if you want to make complex devices, they don't have any stray fields uh, because antiferromagnet means every layer uh, or every one um, site is accompanied by another site which is pointing in the uh, opposite direction. So overall, there is no net magnetic field, dipolar magnetic field far away. And uh, it has been shown that the switching speeds of uh, antiferromagnets uh, can actually be in uh, at a much more uh, smaller time scale. So typical ferromagnets switch, switch in about nanoseconds, uh, and antiferromagnets can actually be made to switch uh, in about time scale, which is hundred times smaller than a nanosecond. Uh, and the other reason why there's a lot of interest is, is uh, you know, using spin waves. Uh, combining it with the fact that you don't have any stray uh, magnetic fields in this materials uh, and the fact that you can launch spin waves that is desirable for making uh, some kind of devices. So the system that we look at is uh, it's an antiferromagnet. Uh, the magnetic moment lies in the plane. So one layer of uh, CRCL3 has magnetic moment pointing in one direction then the other layer. So this is exactly like graphene uh, effectively, uh, but it has a magnetic moment at uh, each of the sites. Whereas there is an, the next layer is, has, is antiferromagnetically coupled with one layer and it points in the opposite direction. So the magnetic unit cell consists of these two, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, sites uh, from the two different layers. Okay, and we know from uh, solid state physics, even phonons, that the moment you have uh, two atom bases, you will have two modes. So in case of phonons, there will be two uh, vibrational modes. In case of magnons, there will be two magnetic modes uh, because you have um, two atom bases. Here, the, the, the two atom bases is because of the inequivalent two sides. So the, these systems have very complex phase diagram. You can have realize an antiferromagnet, a paramagnet, or a ferromagnet by wearing different uh, knobs in your experiment, uh, which is you know, either wearing temperature or externally applied uh, magnetic field. So the phase diagram is where these systems. 
because you can actually overcome or, or the exchange interaction either by um, fluctuations of KBT uh, or by applying an external magnetic field. So we do experiments at low temperatures uh, with uh, gigahertz frequencies. Uh, and typically to study the dynamics, we will have uh, some variant of this kind of, uh, just to give everybody a sense for it, I show this here. But you kind of typically put a small crystal here, which is the spin crystal of PRCL3. And uh, then you look at the uh, transmission of this uh, waveguide. So what happens is when you excite uh, the magnetization, that magnetization uh, changes the transmission properties of this, um, uh, this waveguide. It's analogous to optical studies. If you shine light, uh, it's a scattering experiment. So uh, you, can, uh, you can excite some internal dynamics in the optically active media, it, exactly the same thing happens. And because of the magnetization dynamics, you look at the transmitted signal and that tells, gives you information about uh, what, what is the nature of the dynamics. Um, but you can also apply external uh, fields to tune these uh, dynamics, external magnetic fields, for example. Okay. Uh, Mandar, a quick question. So yeah. by phase shift in the, on the two sides of the wire? Uh, which, uh, uh, this wire? Yeah. So there are two two wires there. Right? There's only one uh, transmission line. This bunch of holes are basically to enforce some boundary condition uh, of uh, for the RF to ground on. The, there's a metal coated on the back also. White is actually the insulating region. Ah, okay. uh, uh, and the, and the, the ma so magnetic field is uh, going parallel to the. L yeah. uh, layer or is it going perpendicular to the so there okay good question i want to talk about it so in the middle of so if you think of this uh, uh, central copper wire the magnetic field on top of it is parallel but in in the gap in the white region is actually also uh, perpendicular to the layer this will become important uh, next thanks for asking this question so in order to switch the magnetization you will need something perpendicular to the layer is that correct or uh so uh, you can uh, you can actually uh, brute force make the magnetization uh, point both the layers magnetization point if you apply large enough magnetic fields uh, dc magnetic fields but that's not so exciting that's uh, uh, you're talking about sort of the dynamics of it so symmetry dictates uh, which uh, uh, dynamics you will uh, excite. I'll talk about it. Then maybe I can address uh, your question. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Mandra. Um, yeah. So these materials are quite volatile, as I hear. How do you protect them from atmosphere or how do you even cleave them? Uh, so we do everything inside the glove box. So even uh, something I have, uh, um, even for Bisco, all of this thing is done inside the glove box. And then we uh, uh, put something, so CRI3 is the worst uh, in the sense it's extremely reactive. Uh, so you have to encapsulate it in uh, boron nitride uh, before you take it out of the glove box because if you leave a crystal and you take it out and you put it under optical microscope in ambient without uh, protecting it, you'll see a tiny droplet of water. It's extremely uh, reactive, I think primarily hygroscopic. So, uh, uh, so you have to use a glove box to deal with these. CRCL3 is not as bad um, as CRI3, but the nevertheless for long experiments, we kind of uh, cover it with something and then cool it down in the cryostat quickly. Uh, so they are not actually sitting in vacuum, they are sitting at low temperatures uh, uh, and inside the cryostat, uh, nothing bad can happen because it's mostly helium uh, or vacuum. So in TIFR, do you have a setup for stamping in glove box? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we do. Oh, that's nice. Um, uh, without that, some experiments are not possible. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so uh, now I kind of gave you a general idea how one uh, studies uh, sort of these magnets. Let me quickly talk about our experiments. So. Uh, what we uh, do is uh, uh, we do 
these experiments uh, as a function of temperature. So let, let's look at this 1.5 Kelvin data. So as you tune the DC magnetic field, uh, which is sort of, uh, you know, the, the device is sort of, or the sample is kept here. So the DC magnetic field is in plane, uh, okay? Uh, and uh, the R, there are, there as uh, as we just uh, discussed, there are two sort of RF magnetic fields. One is parallel uh, to the plane, uh, but perpendicular to the DC. Uh, and there is some RF field which is perpendicular to the plane of this uh, sort of jig. Um, but the symmetry dictates that you excite. So the, uh, uh, it's important to remind me uh, remind you that um, because you have two magnetic sublattices in this unit cell, you have two modes, okay? Uh, one mode is uh, this mode, which is called acoustic. Uh, you know, it's a, the analog of acoustic uh, phonons in a, uh, in a uh, two atoms in a unit cell kind of uh, lattice. Uh, and what it was the distinction of the acoustic um, is that the relative motion of the uh, or the magnetization dynamics here. So based on the symmetry of this uh, magnetic field, I can excite only the acoustic mode, which is this resonance. So I'm actually um, uh, kind of making these uh, uh, two modes precess uh, uh, in a kind of a resonant way. Uh, so this tells me this sharp feature tells me that uh, I'm able to excite this mode and it's tunable with magnetic field. So as I increase the in-plane magnetic field, the frequency increases and it can go up to about uh, 15 gigahertz or so. Uh, and as I increase the temperature, you'll see that there is some transition here. There's a knee, uh, okay? So that knee uh, will actually slowly come. Down. What's happening is that as I go to higher and higher temperatures, uh, the glue uh, between the two magnetic sublattices is effectively because of the thermal um, uh, energy uh, is being uh, suppressed. Uh, and that's why this knee is kind of coming down for the acoustic mode. So it's as if uh, uh, the acoustic mode is becoming softer and softer. And you can uh, extract some useful information about exchange constants from these kind of measurements, which we did, but I'm going to skip it just for. Uh, uh, for brevity, okay. So the symmetry of the fields that you apply, the oscillating magnetic field and DC allows you to pick which mode you excite. So here you excite only the acoustic mode, uh, which basically involves the two moments uh, when you apply a, a magnetic field, they are no longer uh, anti-parallel, but they get canted. Uh, they, uh, 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 you know, the DC magnetic field direction is in between and the two magnetic moments are uh, sort of on either side of it. This transition from anti-parallel orientation to this canted orientation is basically the spin-flop transition uh, in, in, in antiferromagnet. So now uh, by changing the symmetry, by applying an RF oscillating field in the same direction as the DC field, you can excite the other mode. Uh, rule and that mode is uh, so this is the mode that we talked about which is the acoustic mode now you can excite another mode which is called the optical mode which is at zero magnetic field it has a, um, a non-zero frequency uh, exactly similar picture one would expect from the phonon um, sort of idea uh, as well and you know this it disperses with magnetic field but it this it becomes as you increase the magnetic field it, its frequency drops and at some point, these two modes will become degenerate, but because symmetry protects them, uh, they will uh, cross each other uh, and there won't be any uh, avoided crossing. And what's happening in an uh, uh, optical mode is that the two canted modes are kind of moving in and out. I'll show you a nice graphic to illustrate it. Again, so very nice symmetry properties of the uh, crystal controls the dynamics. So you can visualize it uh, nicely. Uh, so when you ap apply an acoustic uh, antiferromagnetic resonance, uh, this is sort of what's happening. And when you um, look at optical uh, ferromagnetic resonance, uh, it's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, kind of like an op optical phonon, they move uh, out and come in together. Um, okay, that's what an optical phonon would 
uh, optically active phonon uh, does in polar solids. Okay, and exciting which mode that you look at is uh, basically controlled by uh, the symmetry. Uh, okay, what you can do is uh, you can, so this is one magnon branch, this is another magnon branch. Analogy with phonons is this is, would be one phonon, this is another phonon. And uh, you can uh, couple these two, um, okay? And the coupling is basically dictated by breaking the symmetry in the system by applying a, a field which is, has a component perpendicular to it, okay? Uh, and what ha happens is as you apply uh, magnetic fields uh, perpendicular to it, you have two things happening. One is you'll see that this sharp acoustic resonance will actually start to split up into many, many small resonances. Uh, okay, uh, uh, and as you go increase the angle more, you basically increase the efficiency of uh, launching spin waves uh, inside the uh, 2D uh, antiferromagnet. Uh, okay, what's the difference between spin waves and these modes is that these are k equal to zero. Uh, uh, you know, they don't really have any spatial structure, whereas the spin waves. Uh, you know, the ones that are popping up here, they actually are uh, k not dynamics, uh, ex dynamical excitations inside the uh, antiferromagnet. And the other thing that you will notice is that, uh, you know, here you saw these two modes are, have a crossing, but as you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, because you uh, break the symmetry of the system, uh, you will get a, 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 you know, avoided crossing, which is basically a coupling between the acoustic and optical phonon, uh, optical magnons. And in the in this close vicinity, you don't really have either pure acoustic or optical magnon, but you have a you know, kind of an admixture of those excitations. And so, uh, from analyzing these uh, uh, measurements, we were able to extract information that the spin waves in these uh, in these materials can travel long distances, up to twenty microns, which is quite significant. Um, uh, you know. Uh, and the nice thing that about these uh, antiferromagnets is because they don't have, uh, they're kind of insulating. Uh, they have band gaps of about one to two electron volt. Uh, there are no electrons to um, uh, sort of cause dissipation in this magnetic excitation. Typically, if you look at magnetic excitations in metals like uh, cobalt or uh, something like that, uh, uh, the electrons uh, cause a lot of damping losses. Here you don't have those issues uh, at all. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Manza, a quick yeah. question. So those bands are essentially finite thickness effect. Is that what you said? Uh, so, uh, you, you mean uh, these more magnon modes? Oh, no, no, not that. Not that. Uh, when you said that when the magnetic field is in the, some tilted direction, yeah, you get yeah. subbands. This is some finite thickness effect. Is it? Is it like the subbands in the finite thickness well? Is that? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, that's an interesting point. It's not the finite thickness effect. It's basically the symmetry protects the uh, excitation of the magnon mode. So for exciting the uh, uh, acoustic mode. Uh, the time dependent oscillating field has to be perpendicular to the DC field. The moment you pull out a, a component perpendicular to it, uh, that nice um, uh, uh, symmetry is gone and you get a hybridization between uh, them. I, I don't, it's, let me think more about the comment, but I don't think it's because of finite thickness. So down to one layer, you will, it's basically a reflection of the fact that the magnons uh, are cannot be purely described as acoustic or optical in in this region that's the way i would think about it okay maybe i misunderstood the plot that picture that B no no no, no no so okay this picture is primarily to explain this existence of the spin waves uh, which are actually transverse which are due to finite size effect it's like standing waves oh, no, that's what i was like, asking yeah, that, yeah those oh, were the bands so that's this is correct, but the avoided crossing here. Oh, that I understood. I was asking yeah. about these subbands. That yeah, yeah. Okay, that is absolutely correct. Sorry, I misunderstood your question. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, these are essentially, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, magnon subbands, if you like. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm almost done. So where we are headed with this, so one of the areas that we're really excited about is uh, uh, sort of trying to realize. Uh, sort of uh, 
quantum systems where uh, we can couple magnons and photons. So in the past experiment, I showed you experiment where a magnon can be coupled to another ma uh, magnon mode of the system, which is uh, fun. Uh, but for uh, uh, some interesting experiments, uh, uh, you know, hi making hybrid quantum systems, one want to hybridize a magnon with a photon, and uh, you know, so you can do some fun transduction. Um, and so uh, we. Uh, we try to couple a, a photon. So this photon is not the visible photon, but a photon that lives in a, a coplanar cavity. These are photons, photons. So we make superconducting cavities, um, which are basically this meander line, and they have a small capacitor, coupling capacitor. We put in RF inside, and uh, because the losses are less, the photon has a standing wave mode. And then we put this magnetic material on it, uh, and uh, what ends up happening is uh, you will have this oscillating magnetic field, which is uh, confined, and that couples to the magnetic moments of the magnetic material. And uh, you can basically realize a hybrid excitation, which is uh, you know a photon and a magnon uh, as well. So uh, what the way uh, the experimental signature for these is that you know this is sort of the plot that I showed you. You have these different modes, but what we do is we select one frequency, one precise frequency where the cavity is resonant. Uh, okay, uh, so that basically means uh, I, I sit uh, a sharp resonance, which is the uh, cavity resonance which sits here, and now that will interact with the a magnon modes which are in this sh shaded uh, sort of dashed region. And what ends up happening is uh, you get a hybridization. So the photon is actually doesn't depend on the magnetic field at all. It's just completely flat. But there are two going up like this because uh, this is a, a, a short region of frequency which is in this dashed box. So what ends up happening is you get these avoided crossings. Uh, and that avoided crossing is an uh, uh, indication that the magnon, this is a one magnon branch, this is another magnon branch that hybridizes with the photon uh, because the photon uh, would uh, un, um, sort of the pristine photon mode is just completely horizontal. It doesn't care about the magnetic field. And this avoided crossing is a signature that one can hybridize the uh, magnon excitation and the photon. And there are some interesting uh, experiments that we can do. So uh, what I want to point out is that the resonant frequencies of these uh, magnons uh, uh, is about few gigahertz. And at, you know, at temperatures in, uh, of 10 millikelvin, uh, if you uh, have brute force cooled it down, then you can actually uh, think of the, you know, uh, accomplishing a regime where you have one magnon or a magnon mode occupancy of less than one, because at 10 uh, millikelvin, um, uh, H cross omega for the magnon is larger than uh, KBT. Same thing for the optical cavity. So it's like, uh, you know, two um, uh, modes uh, which whose occupancies themselves are, can be uh, designed to be less than one uh, and you're actually making them uh, couple. Uh, that can uh, lead to some interesting um, sort of experiments. Uh, and that's an area that we are uh, spending a lot of energy uh, trying to uh, set up experiments. Uh, that's basically all I wanted to tell you. I told you about our experiments with a superconductor and a 2D magnet. Uh, and I gave you some idea about where we are headed next in terms of devices. Uh, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, sorry, I went over maybe three or four minutes. My apologies. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm happy to answer questions. I wonder this is a good. Uh, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, uh, so Mandar, uh, can you go to your slide 23 where you're showing this photovoltaic data? Yes. Uh, so uh, this, uh, you know, the second figure and the middle figure. Yeah. About so this one. So these dotted lines are the chromium wire. 
there you, you should think of this as insul uh, insulating uh, region okay so oh those are the insulating region yeah okay okay and uh, photovoltaics is generating at the middle point yes that's I mean, right the maximum yeah so uh, the uh, you know the width of these uh, wires is actually about a micron so these aspect ratio just to for you to be able to see we have stretched in in the vertical direction this length is about uh, 20 microns uh, but the beam spot that we have uh, is larger than the width of the nanowire okay uh, so this stretching out shows you uh, that uh, uh, the the spread in the hotspot does that answer your question so what is the thickness of this chromium wire i mean how thick are they uh, they, this is the top view. So the, the their their thickness is about ten nanometers, okay. ten to twelve nanometers. I see, and that's why they are uh, insulating. Underneath Bisco is insulating. Okay. I mean, chromium itself. Uh, you know, everything is a superconductor. So even if you put a normal metal on top of it, let's say it's conducting, it's uh, it's it's going to get shunted by the uh, superconductor. But in this is basically flowing um, through the uh, uh, through this region. Okay, so underneath the visco is insulating, but the chromium is in the metallic phase. Yeah, it it could be in metallic phase. It it doesn't matter because the current is going to flow through the least resistance path, which is through the superconducting branch. Yeah, but then how across this chromium wire you will see the voltage gradient? No, it's, this is not a voltage gradient. This is a, you. Sh, the meaning of it is you shine light here. It uh -huh. will the chromium still conducts heat. Okay, so it will when you shine laser, it uh -huh. it it will absorb some light and uh, transfer the heat uh, in in the plane. So that's why uh, you know the, this is X Y positioning tells you if I shine a laser here. Even if it's not on the superconductor, mm -hmm. it will dump some heat. This is detector is a bolometric detector. It basically converts uh, uh, the energy into uh, heat, which can, uh, you basically causes resistance change. I see. I see. So, so it depends on the your uh, laser power. I mean, how much yeah, power will be generated? Uh, yeah, it's it's certainly uh, a function of laser power. Uh, in, in, in the photovoltaics that you generate, because okay. I showed you data which is responsivity, mm -hmm. you can benchmark in uh, essentially volt per watt of energy that you uh, have in your laser. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, sir. Thanks for a nice talk. So I have one question. You uh, said that you have used a uh, superionic solid for electrostatic gating for this mm -hmm. So, what is the solid? It's a glass. It's a. It's basically a soda lime glass. Uh, a glass which has sodium ions in it. You can use lithium lithiated glass as well. Uh, that also works. Uh, some people also use ionic liquids. Um, yeah, but we have found that ionic liquids can actually be very detrimental to such devices so that's why we use this ionic glass does that answer your question yeah yeah so uh, if you want uh, yeah yeah if you want details about what glass it is or who's the what is the vendor you send me an email i will send you the details okay okay, okay. thank you thank you and uh, one more thing it uh, works well in the low temperature because i was thinking that if this uh, ions uh, freeze in low temperature a good question. Uh, so this, so if I want to dope it, I didn't show you our studies on doping today so much, but to gate it, you have to warm up this device up to something close to room temperature. So something like 260 to 70 uh, Kelvin, change the gate voltage and then cool back down. So for every realization of doping, you have to come to room temperature because the mobility of the ions at low temperature is close to zero. So below 200 Kelvin, the ions don't move around, the sodium ions. So uh, to change the doping level, you have to bring the device up to close to 
300 Kelvin, change the doping, then uh, cool back the device. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. You yeah. can't do that at low temperature um, because of the poor, extremely poor mobility. Okay. So it works uh, way less the ionic but uh, it will not create any problem. Uh, yeah, I personally prefer it. Uh, it's uh, you have to be careful with um, because the Debye layer, uh, uh, you know, applying arbitrary uh, doping level can still cause uh, uh, the ions to uh, strongly interact or undergo some chemical reaction with even if with a glass. Uh, you have to be careful. Uh, I, but I think it, these are. I personally prefer this to uh, ionic liquids. We have worked uh, with ionic liquids. Okay. Thank you. Mandar, mm -hmm. for this uh, uh, mapping of the sample with the laser, do you actually map it by moving the laser or you move the sample under the laser? Uh, no, we have a PSO. Uh, it's an atto cube in, the, uh, in our Montana cryostat. So we can spatially image it. It's a relative motion. Sorry. It's a relative yeah. motion that is for needed for a mapping. So uh, our laser is fixed. We just move around the sample. And in this Montana cryostat, the sample is laser. Sorry, sample is vapor cooled or is this conductive cooling? Uh, it's a cold finger. It's vacuum. I see. And uh, then in that case, your uh, this peach sauce, uh, there is some connection from the cold yeah. finger to the sample. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, so I have one question. Yeah. Have you observed any formation of uh, skarmions in the uh, uh, CRCL3 materials? Um, no. Uh, we, uh, I mean, I, I um, in the skarmions, there are some reports. Uh, we have not seen, in fact, that people have discussed with us the possibility that you can see excitations of uh, uh, the associated with skirmions or collective modes of skirmion. Uh, we have not. Uh, we have some plans uh, to look uh, at some other physics, but uh, um, not directly with skirmions, but uh, it, it will be interesting to see um, if you can couple to the skirmions uh, or excite the dynamical modes of, uh, let's say, skirmion lattices. Uh, so the short answer is we have not uh, done those experiments. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, if you have any questions about any of the experimental details or if where we get what crystal from or how we do it, uh, I'm happy to share whatever information uh, you need. So please send me an email. Uh, I uh, will be happy to share that information. Um, there are uh, no uh, secrets. Okay, so I'm happy to share whatever information we have. <clears throat> okay, uh, I see that the, uh, the question. Yeah kind of trickling to a halt. Uh, I mean, uh, if, we, if we need some advice for, for uh, building uh, an exfoliation setup within the glove box, I'll come to you. Sure, yeah. In the future. I'm not yeah. sure when, but... Sure, yeah. Uh, we certainly have no... Uh, uh, I mean, we, we have learned it by making mistakes, but uh, it's, uh, I'm happy to share whatever information. If it uh, short circuits your learning curve, I'm happy to share whatever we know. So we, uh, yeah, we, we have uh, figured out automated flake searching procedure also. So it, in the lockdown, uh, we used to just load the chip and remotely it used to take pictures and uh, 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 the students wrote a Python script. It will shortlist uh, good candidates for flakes. So then uh, you only look at those photographs and uh, make the devices. Um, so uh, uh, the students were uh, very... Um, resourceful. This is so nice. So if this is not machine learning, then what it is? Right. Yeah, so we use some of the ideas of, uh, there's actually a paper which has uh, kind of more sophisticated machine learning things uh, for shortlisting flakes and 
uh, if you're in the 2D device business, you know that that's one of the time consuming uh, thing which requires a lot of art. Um, uh, but you can um, shorten some of the processes by uh, kind of some automation. Yeah, I know it's also quite taxing to the eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, looks like there are no more questions. I thank you again for the uh, opportunity to discuss with you our experiments. Uh, I'm always open for comments and critiques. So if you have something, uh, some comments or some criticism, please feel free to email me. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.